Ecclesiastes 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing, good congregational singing, good special singing. Lord, I was listening to the words of the song, and I was uh, certainly I appreciate good music and good musicians that know how to play. But Lord, those songs... Without music, it just seemed to resonate in this place tonight. Thank you for those that, Lord, yielded themselves to you and you gave them the words of those songs. Thank you for those that sang them tonight, who didn't sing them to be seen, but sang to honor the Lord. Yes. And God, we certainly do thank you for the good singing. Thank you for the good testimonies. And thank you for being a good God. Now bless the reading of the Word of God. Help us tonight. Lord, open our minds to understand thy word. Open our hearts to receive thy word. And God, help us to leave different than we entered into your sanctuary tonight. I do pray for Miss Debbie and her family. God, you'd comfort them in the loss of her brother. Father, I pray for our country. I pray for those that are, Lord, without power. and Some have lost their homes. They've lost everything. I know churches that have uh, uh, received destruction. And I know many of your people that are doing without tonight. And, Lord, uh, uh, communities, Lord, have just been uprooted. And, God, I pray that in the midst of all of this, that, God, you would uh, dispatch some grace dispatch exactly what is needed by these folks. And then, Father, we do pray that, Lord, any that aren't saved, they'd get saved as a result of this tragedy. They'd realize their own mortality, and they'd come to Christ. God, I certainly do pray for a revival for our churches. I pray for a revival for our church. I pray that, Lord, you'd begin to work in our hearts, maybe even tonight. That, Lord, by the time that we're in meeting here a month from now, that, Lord, we'd really be in meeting. Father, I do pray uh, for Miss Crystal that you'd undergird her and you'd strengthen her in this next round of treatments. And, God, I pray uh, for the great master, the glo glorious God, the great physician, to touch her because there's no touch like the master's touch. And, Father, I certainly do pray for others that are sick, others that are providentially hindered tonight. But Father, for the next few minutes, help us to focus on you. Speak to our hearts. Use this unworthy vessel. Glorify your namesake, Father, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to these three verses. And as a way of introduction, I want you to notice, first of all, the personal responsibility that we're exhorted to have. Look, if you will, again in verse number 1, he says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear. We see that he is telling us in our personal responsibility that we are to guard our vessel. He says, keep your foot. He says, be more ready to hear. We have a personal responsibility for our own individual standing before God. Listen, you can't expect somebody else to keep your foot. You can't expect somebody else to make you ready for what God has for you. It is your responsibility to guard your vessel. You ought to keep your foot. In other words, uh, your walk before the Lord ought to be pure. Your walk before the Lord uh, ought to lean toward holiness. Uh, your walk before the Lord ought to never dishonor the Lord uh, or, any, uh, or His church or any of God's people. Uh, you ought to keep your foot. Uh, it is not 
not the pastor's responsibility. It is not a Sunday school teacher's responsibility. It is not a deacon's responsibility. It is not anybody else's responsibility uh, to help you to walk the way you're supposed to walk. Uh, you are responsible to give an account of yourself to God. Uh, you ought to get in the scriptures, uh, see how God wants you to walk, uh, and walk thereby. Uh, it is your responsibility to keep your foot, and it is also uh, your and my responsibility uh, to be more ready to hear when we come into the sanctuary of God uh, uh, than uh, 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 not to be ready to hear. Uh, uh, what a blessing you came tonight. We're thankful for that. Uh, uh, we're certainly glad to see you. But if you didn't come to receive something from God, uh, if you didn't come to hear from heaven, uh, you're going to leave the same way you came in uh, and you're going to leave grossly disappointed. Uh, it is your responsibility to come in ready to receive what God has for you. Did you come in ready to hear? Oh. Amen. Can I say most churches today are nothing more than glorified social clubs? Right. Amen. Matter of fact, they can have somebody, uh, a new preacher come in and change the entire doctrine that the church has stood for for years. They don't care because they don't worship God. They come and worship brick and mortar. This is where my people have always come. This is where we're going to come. It's not about the doctrine. Well, friend, if it's not about the doctrine, then you're grossly wrong. Can I say? Amen. Uh, without the right doctrine, you don't have a church. Amen. Mm -hmm. You just got a social club. It amazes me. Folks, uh, uh, they, they want to come out and spend more time with their friends than they want to come out and spend time with God. We have a personal responsibility to guard our vessel, but we also have a personal uh, responsibility uh, uh, to be geared up to receive what God has for us. Amen. Not only keep our foot, but be more ready to hear. We ought to be geared up. We ought to come to the house of God yeah. excited to hear what God has no, for us. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I've known a couple preachers, a couple pastors over the years that have done this. And... Uh, I think Brother Bob at one time was in a church where they had to do this, where every man in the congregation had to study and get it up and give a lesson. You say, well, I don't know if I could do that. Well, why couldn't you? See, he does that, the pastor does that, Brother Jim, so that that man will realize how much effort it takes to stand up and bring forth a message. How much study, how much prayer, how much preparation, how much dealing with your nerves. I've been doing this 37 years. I still get butterflies before I stand preaching. I told one young preacher, he said, I get nervous every time I preach. I said, when you quit getting nervous, that's when it's time to quit. Because you're standing before God and man. And you see, if people realize how much effort and prayer and time uh, went into standing and proclaiming what thus saith the Lord, uh, they'd be more excited to come and hear. See, we take for granted. Well, we're just coming in and we're going to hear from heaven. What if God shut the spigot off? Hmm? We have a personal responsibility in guarding our vessel and gearing up to receive, but also a personal responsibility concerning gross negligence. Look what verse 1 says. Keep thy foot when thou goest in the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Do you realize when anybody comes in and does something out of order, they're doing evil? even though they're in church? Amen. Boy, that got real quiet. Do you know the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's verse 31, let everything be done decent and in order? Right. Amen. Hmm? When we do not do things decently and in order, when we get out of order, it's evil in the sight of God. We ought to come praying and come with a discerning spirit to mind the Lord that if the pastor opens up the floor to give a testimony, if God's burning in your heart like the two gentlemen tonight that testified to glorify God, uh, 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 you ought to be ready to do that. But if God doesn't touch your heart, he doesn't push your button, you don't say a thing. 
be more, it would be better not to say anything than do something out of order because you're doing evil. Do you realize that when the pastor asks for testimonies and you stand and give a prayer request, you're out of order? Yes, sir. And I've taught on that before, only to find people say, Hey, Brother Doug, can I give a prayer request? I didn't ask for that. Matter of fact, I've also said it is never the will of God for you to say something twice in a service. In other words, you speak two times in a service. If we're having a testimony service and all of a sudden God gets to blowing in here and folks testify, and then about ten people later and say, oh, Can I say something else? Matter of fact, I told one person no. That is uh, kind of like a hallmark thing at my family around uh, uh, holidays. I say, remember when Dad told that person no, they couldn't testify? Because <laughs> well, they were out of order. That's evil. See, we don't think about that. We think we come to church, we're all good. Brother Ron already explained, there's none to do with good. No, not one. Heaven's not for good people, it's for saved people. I preached one time years ago, liberty is not a license. Just because you have liberty does not give you a license to do it. If I ask for a song, if anybody's got a song, just because you have a talent, don't mean it's the will of God for you to sing that night. Hmm? It's all about doing things in the order that God wants them done. Amen. Well, that went over real well, didn't it? <laughs> It's serious business when we come to the house of God. It's life or death. There are things in the balance. There may be somebody here tonight that is really struggling, and if we grieve or quench the Holy Spirit, they may not get the help that they need tonight. There may be somebody that comes into the sanctuary lost without Christ, uh, and if we grieve the Holy Ghost, uh, they'll not get under conviction, and they may die and go to hell. It is serious business. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful that we finally have gotten the invitation time right. Years ago, I'd get so vexed, it'd be invitation time. We'd ask people to stand. We're inviting folks to come to Christ, and people are putting their coats on. They're wrangling their keys. They've got their mind everywhere, but people doing business with God. As soon as it'd be, I'd say, it's time for the invitation. Let's all stand. People get up and leave. That's not the time to leave, friends. Because right. when people leave, guess who else leaves? The Holy Ghost. Right. Hmm. I'm thankful for folks that are now sensitive in the, visit, in the invitation period because we don't want things done with gross negligence because God says it's evil. We see the personal responsibility in verse number one. Notice the preventing of recklessness in verse number two. He says, Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few. Solomon is talking about approaching the Lord in prayer. He says, don't be rash or hasty with your words. Amen. Worst thing we can do is run into our prayer cause or run to the altar in prayer to God and try and start telling God what to do. He's reminding us God's in heaven. My, my, as a matter of fact, His throne is on the sides of the north. Everything is below Him. And God is looking down upon all things. God is in control of all things. You remember what He said in Ezekiel? He sought for a man to stand and make up the, the hedge, but He found none. The Lord is looking and seeking. And when we run to Him in prayer and we start telling Him what to do, that's rash and hasty. That is personal recklessness. Matter of fact, what we need to do is we need to approach God with reverence and we come before Him and it'd be more important for us to sit there and listen for a minute before we start saying anything. Amen. There have been many times in my life I come before God, don't know what to say to Him, and I just ask Him, God, what would you have me to pray for? And just sit there. You don't have to sit there long. He'll start flooding your heart with things. Hmm. We see 
We need to prevent recklessness. We don't need to be rash or hasty when talking to God or about the things of God. But then we also see in these verses a proposed realization. Verse number 3 says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. This is a wonderful verse. You know what this verse is saying? Say a dream or a goal is realized through hard work. And you can always tell a fool when they open their mouth and they start speaking. In other words, he's saying, talk's cheap. Things get done through hard work. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Amen. But I've seen a lot of people sit back and say, boy, I wish I had what they had. Well, if you worked as hard as they did, you'd have it. But I've also seen people that don't have anything, but they're quick to tell somebody that has everything how to, how to run their stuff. Right. Huh? <laughs> Never ceases to amaze me. The guy sweeping the floor in the plant knows more than the guy running the plant. Just hang around him long enough, he'll tell you how that place needs to run. Hmm? Huh? But yet the guy sweeping the floor never put up the millions of dollars it took to have the plant, never de deals with all the, uh, uh, the ordinances and all the uh, uh, red tape and all the paperwork to be able to have a plant, uh, doesn't ever deal with uh, what it takes to pay for the benefits and what it takes to pay for workman's comp and what it takes to keep the lights on, what it takes to keep an inventory coming in, what it takes to keep shipping going to get inventory out, doesn't have any idea what it really does uh, take to run a plant. All he knows is he's pushing a broom for, you know, eight bucks an hour and he knows more than the guy running the thing. Never goes home and has to lose sleep over maybe having to lay off workers. Right. Never goes home and loses sleep over uh, 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 the bottom line uh, being down. Doesn't, doesn't have to ever deal with that, but he knows more. Same thing happens in church. You have somebody that never prays, never reads their Bible, shows up about once a month, but they know more than the pastor. They know more than the deacons. They know more than people that are faithful, that are uh, constantly got their hands uh, 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 to the plow and constantly got their hands to the horns of the altar, uh, uh, seeking the will of God. But uh, that Johnny come lately always knows more. Hmm? Amen. Uh, listen. In all three of these verses, I'm reminded of something that's been proven out in my life. Many mistakes happen when we get in a hurry mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. or when we get too much of us involved. Yeah. I'm interested in verse number one. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. I'm interested in that phrase, the sacrifice of fools. And I want to preach on that tonight for just a minute. I want to preach on the sacrifice of fools. Can I say, first of all, the sacrifice of fools is a works salvation. Somebody that believes they can work their way to heaven. They are offering to God their works. They are offering to God their abilities. They are offering to God uh, all that they can muster up uh, in order to impress God. Can I help you tonight? Uh, 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 baptism will not get anybody to heaven. Can I help you tonight? Uh, uh, listen, uh, 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 all the money in the world can't buy your way into heaven. Uh, uh, you say, I gave this, and I did this, and I sold this, and I was a part of this. Uh, I served. Uh, I, I remember when they used to give you a pin uh, 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 every year for your birthday. You came forward. They sang you happy birthday. Uh, and 
I've seen people had 39 pins where they were in church on their birthday. Yeah, you can have every pin and every pin cushion uh, uh, from here to Kalamazoo and that will not get you into heaven. Uh, uh, listen, uh, going to church doesn't get you to heaven. Uh, hey, uh, uh, listen, uh, all your intellect will not get you to heaven. Uh, a work salvation will not get you to heaven. Any si anything outside uh, the very grace of God uh, will not get you to heaven. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 very quick uh, simply says, uh, for by grace uh, are you saved uh, through faith. Uh, and that not of yourselves, uh, it is the gift of God, uh, not of works, uh, lest any man should boast. Uh, friends, it's not our works that'll get us to heaven. Uh, uh, our works uh, are the works of fools uh, and the uh, sacrifice of fools. Uh, it took the work uh, of Calvary uh, and the work uh, of a triune holy God uh, who came to this world uh, hey, uh, and he made himself of no reputation uh, and he took on himself the form of a servant uh, and he yielded himself to the cross uh, and he gave his life. Uh, he bled and died uh, for your sin and my sin. Uh, he was buried and rose again according to the scriptures the third day uh, under his own power uh, and he made a way uh, where sinners could be saved uh, and friends uh, he came to where you were uh, in your lowest state uh, and he showed you your need of a savior uh, hey Noah found grace in the eyes of God uh, and anybody that goes to heaven uh, it's all been a work of grace uh, by a holy God uh, to an unholy people uh, I'm going to heaven uh, cause Jesus saved my soul hallelujah and there are a lot of people offering their lives on an altar of a sacrifice of fools and they're going to die and go to hell because uh, they're trusting in their works you can have a catechism you can uh, have a, 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 any kind of otherism and you'll die and go to hell you better have Jesus he's the only one to save you from your sin now works are important we find that out in verse 10 of Ephesians 2 it says for we are his workmanship yes, sir. it's not about my works I'm a product of his workmanship right. for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, my works didn't count till I got in Christ uh, and then I became part of his workmanship uh, unto good works uh, he saved me uh, and now I'm to live uh, unto good works and do good works uh, and I'm to show the world my faith by my works uh, because of what Jesus has done in my life uh, said which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them Long before there ever was a world, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost decided that one day uh, they would come uh, and they would make a way for sinners to be saved. Uh, uh, it was preordained before the four counts of the world that Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Uh, he made a plan for sinners. I got news for you. Long before there's ever a sinner, there was a Savior. And I bless His holy name. Amen. But can I say, the sacrifice of fools is a work salvation. Right. Hmm. There are a lot of people, good moral people, that are putting their faith in a denomination. And they're going to die and go to hell because they've mis been misled. And friends, it is our responsibility because where the, the Bible says where much is given, much is required. We have been granted the truth, and we are to herald it. We are to use that Bible as a trumpet. We're to let people know Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We're to be a light with our life and our lips to let people know there is a way to heaven, and His name is Jesus. Anything else is the sacrifice of fools. Can I say the sacrifice of fools is a work salvation? It's also a worldly spin.
Can I say I'm sick and tired? I'm sick up to here. I'm sick. I mean, I want to regurgitate out my nose at the thought. Sam, that means puke. I mean, I just am absolutely tired, spent in my mind of places that once proclaimed the truth, but now they don't even resemble a church. They look more like a nightclub, look more like a dance hall. They sound more like a dance hall. Uh, it doesn't sound like anything spiritual to me. I'm so tired of places that call themselves churches today that don't even resemble a church. Amen. Can I say men destitute of the truth taught other men who have carried that same destitution of truth into churches and they have uh, drank the Kool-Aid to tell people well, the only way to grow a church in this day and age is we've got to reach out to young people. And the only way to reach out to young people, we've got to make it more convenient for them to come to church, and we've got to make it more accessible to, for them to come to church, and we've got to make the church like things that they like, music like they like, have dramas and plays and watered-down gospels, and hey, let's just come on out, make it real convenient, make everything so, so uh, worldly that they'll like us. Amen. You never win the world becoming like the world. Amen. Jesus told us that we were the light of the world, and a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We're not to cover our light with a bushel of worldliness. Hmm. We're, my dear friends, uh, to stand out and be a separate people. Amen. We're to be a peculiar people. We're to be a people that the world mocks and laughs at uh, and throw everything they can at us and they cannot deter us. And we become the envy of them. My dear friends, we are to be Christ-like. You can never be worldly and be Christ-like. Listen to how John put it in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrist, uh, whereby we know that it is the last time. Uh, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. Uh, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Uh, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. You know what that tells me? People that uh, leave something as fundamental and true and right and go for something worldly, they don't have an unction of the Holy One. Amen. Hmm. You can't have the Holy Ghost in you and think that this worldly religion today is right. Amen. Now let me talk to some of you that maybe uh, think every church is just like our church. Do you know in our area, not that long ago, there was a man who calls himself a pastor who got on a platform and opened a beer, a can of beer, and told the congregation that if Jesus was here, he'd have a beer with him. You know what that is? That's wicked. Amen. That's worldly. Amen. Huh? Jesus said strong drinks are mockery. Hmm? 
And don't give me that Jesus drank wine. No, Jesus drank new wine. Do you know what new wine is? We call it grape juice. He didn't drink fermented, intoxicating stuff. Uh, matter of fact, when he changed the water to wine, uh, uh, the uh, uh, man of the feast said, why did we save the good, uh, the best for the end? Uh, why? What was he saying? All the other stuff was intoxicating. Uh, this is good wine. Uh, this is fresh grape juice. Uh, this is the good stuff, my dear friends. Uh, can I say, not too long ago in our area, there was a so-called church, had a man from California who was the pastor of the porn church get up and say how porn, pornography is normal and should be incorporated in your Christian life. Not too long ago in our area, there was a place called the River Church that was full of hot tubs, and uh, uh, they all came into church in their bathing suits and got in a hot tub and had a little devotion in the hot tub. That's real spiritual. Uh, can I say, uh, many of the Southern Baptist churches in this area that used to thunder truth from the pulpits, uh, uh, today do not use the Word of God when they stand. Uh, most of them don't even have pulpits anymore. Uh, uh, most of them have rock bands instead of choirs anymore. Uh, most of them don't have uh, hymn books anymore. Uh, they don't sing to Him and about Him and for Him. Uh, it's all worldly. And they wonder why our church is in our mess. Used to, if a young lady got with child outside of wedlock, it was considered sinful. Right. Now in some of these places, they glorify it. They bend over backwards to make her feel unashamed about that because they're fearful she's going to go commit another sin, abort the baby. Listen, you ought to love her and you ought to strive to restore her but you never glorify her sin. And by the way, you don't glorify the young man's sin either. Amen. Oh, Brother Doug, you're so old-fashioned. Thank you very much. I'm saying worldly spins are the sacrifice of fools. What do you think about... I talked to my buddy, buddy Brother Ray. He's more narrow-minded than me. What do you think about a man that used to preach the truth and now because of fear of the people, he'll let all that junk go on in the church? What do you think it's going to be like when he stands for God? You all may vote me out tomorrow, but blessed be the name of the Father, I'm going to earnestly contend for what God's put in my soul regardless if you all follow me or not. Because one day I'm going to stand before God. And I'll stand before him ashamed of things that I've said and done throughout the years, but I'll never be ashamed for the stand on the Scriptures. Amen. Mm. God help us yes. to realize things with a worldly spin are the sacrifice of fools. Why do you think I had Brother Adrian teach that series on casual Christianity, which is nothing more than carnal Christianity? which is really not Christianity. Amen. God help us. Some of you about to die. I got three more points. I thought about some more sacrifice of fools. Can I say a wordy suffrage is the sacrifice of fools. You say, what are you talking about, Brother Doug? I'm talking about no heartfelt confession. There are a lot of people that have a head knowledge of Christ. They've said a prayer. They've said the words. They've been baptized. They sit on church pews. But nothing ever transpired in their heart. All they have is a wordy suffrage. Uh, they were never under Holy Ghost conviction. Uh, a lot of times uh, they made their wordy suffrage uh, to appease somebody else that might have been witnessing to them. Maybe a family member. Uh, they just wanted to get them off their back. Uh, uh, maybe just uh, uh, get out of jail quicker. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, uh, but 
listen, uh, 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 it was not uh, under the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. They weren't drawn by uh, uh, the Holy Ghost to the Savior. Uh, listen, uh, when he shows you you're lost, uh, uh, hey, uh, there's an aching down inside. Uh, let you know you've broken the law of God. Uh, let you know you're on your way to hell as a sinner. Uh, listen, uh, uh, you realize how holy God is and how worthless you are. Uh, you don't come popping bubble gum uh, and don't even bow a knee to God and say you got saved. Uh, you might have got something, uh, but you didn't get saved by the grace of God. Uh, when God saves you, He changes you from the inside out. Uh, Bible said in Romans 10, 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Listen, uh, 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 God saves us. Uh, it happens in our heart uh, and comes out our mouth. Uh, it don't come out our mouth uh, and then we work it down in our heart. It don't work that way. Uh, hey, uh, a head knowledge uh, is still lost before God. Uh, Brother Bob used to keep that little tape in his Bible. It's 18 inches from your head to your heart roughly. That's the difference between going to heaven and going to hell. That's why we got that little track I found, 18 inches. Listen, a lot of people, they know Jesus was born in a stable we celebrate Christmas. They know Easter. We celebrate His resurrection. They they know. They say we got we're a Christian nation. Hogwash. Uh, uh, they go to church on Christmas and Easter. Uh, they think they're okay. They say grace at Thanksgiving. Uh, they have a head knowledge about the things of God, but they don't know Him in an intimate, personal uh, way because uh, they've never trusted in Him as Lord and Savior. Right. And a wordy suffrage is the sacrifice of fools. There's even a crowd out there that says, if you don't say these certain words, you can't be saved. I don't even remember what I said. All I remember is he moved in. I made my way to an altar and I was broken, but I got up, I was blessed. There's a difference. Can I say, a worship that is superficial is the sacrifice of fools. What are you talking about? I'm talking about it's vain, self-glorifying worship. That is the sacrifice of fools. But Charlie, it is a horrible and a vain thing that if God is blessing in a service and God touches Brother Lucas to stand up and testify and he stands up and testify, but you want to feel important like Lucas and you do it just so you can be seen of everybody because Lucas stood up and everybody said amen. That's wicked. You stand up and testify when God tells you to stand up and testify. And I know you would. I know you well enough. But you sat on the front row and you get picked on tonight. Hmm? But I've seen it happen. I see God moving in the service. God be blessing. I mean, testimonies will come from heaven. And I mean, folks stand up broken. And then somebody just thinks, well, I want to say something. And they'll stand up and it's all about them. Kill the service. And can I say, they offered up something on the sacrifice of fools. And can I say, that's wicked. The Bible says this. In Philippians 2, 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. We ought to come into the service saying, Lord, if you want me to say something, I'd be willing to, but Lord, I'd rather everybody else say something for me. Lord, uh, there's, there's so, much, so many more wonderful people in this church than me. Lord, I, help my brother or my sister tonight. I'll say amen if they say something, but Lord, if you want me to, I'll do it for you. So there's too many people will say things or get up and sing or get in the choir or want to stand behind a pulpit because they want to be seen. That's wicked. God knows my heart. I know I'm the pastor, but I have no problem sitting down and letting another man God preach. I need preaching too. And listen, I don't care if it's that 15-year-old young man 
or if that's that year old man back there. Amen. Doesn't matter. If God puts his hand on somebody, I'd gladly sit down, let him preach, and I'll encourage them while they're preaching. Because it's not about me. It's about the Lord. Amen. I'm a zero with the hole knocked out of it, and I know that. But yet there are so many people that have a superficial worship because they think they need to be heard. They think they need to be seen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says you got your reward. But the Bible also says keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools for they consider not that they do evil. Who would ever thought, Brother Phil, somebody stand up and giving a testify, testimony would be evil in the sight of God? Amen. But if they're out of order, not doing it right, and they're doing it for promotion of self, it's evil. Amen. Hmm. Matthew 15, 8 says, this, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. A lot of people worship God in vain. Hmm. Colossians 2, 18 tells us as a body, it's an epistle to the church, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. There's some people full of flesh. And can I say, they're offering up things on the sacrifice and sacrificing the fools. And then the last thing I thought about, and this is probably where most people would be more guilty of offering the sacrifice of fools. The sacrifice of fools is a whimsical supposing. It's where we come to church just lighthearted, taking for granted that God's going to meet with us, that God's going to show up, that God's going to be, that we don't come in carrying the weight of the burden of meeting with God. We don't come in with the weight of depending on God to meet with yeah. us. Yeah. We just think, oh, he's going to show up. And there are people that have that mentality. God help us. God yeah. don't have to show up. God don't have to yeah. speak to us. God don't have to bless us. Amen. I love that song, Micah Henson. He's in heaven tonight. I love that song that he wrote years ago. If he never blessed me again, I'd still want to serve him. Huh? God help us. Can I say... Most don't enter a sanctuary with the same demeanor that they would if they knew they was going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ personally. But we should. Because we are coming before the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm? Most of us don't even come into church with the same demeanor if we was going to stand before a judge or a president, or the governor. We come before Almighty God. I wonder how our demeanor would be if, we, if he was actually sitting here tonight. Because right. I got news for you, he is. Right. Amen. I'll say all this. I'll be done. Many offer the sacrifice of fools out of ignorance. People take the, take the, the Eucharist and drink the wine... Catholic mass they're doing it out of ignorance they've never been taught the truth mm -hmm. they don't know any better you'd think common sense would say why in the world would you bow before a man in a dress and call him father and he has no children that we know of <laughs> might want to check the registry of nuns but anyway Many offer the sacrifice of fools in ignorance. Yet far too many who sit under biblical teaching offer it 
because of pride and self-will. And pride and self-will is just vanity. God resisteth the proud, but to give it grace to the humble. So why the message tonight? God help us to never offer anything as a sacrifice of fools. God help us to be sober of the privilege and come seeking and ready to meet with Almighty God. As we come seeking Him, we come desiring Him, and we come ready for what He has for us, I promise you we'll have revival. Amen. God help us. And again, it's all personal responsibility. God help us to want to meet with God and never offer anything as a sacrifice to fools. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. Baby, need to come pray for somebody tonight. Maybe you need to come thank the Lord for something he's done in your life. Maybe you need to just come tell him you love him. Maybe he spoke something specific to your heart you need to come talk to him about. The altar's open. Never take for granted the privilege of having an altar to come and bow before the Lord. So preacher, I can't bow before the Lord at an altar. You can bow your head and your heart to him there in your pew. But oh, we ought to certainly... Bless the Lord that he even looks our way. Folks are coming. Let's pray. Father, we sure do bless you. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, I pray you'd wink at our ignorance. I pray in your wrath you'd remember mercy. I pray that you'd help us in the days and weeks to come to be as sober and as serious about worship as you are. Help us, Lord, to strive for nothing less than you and your righteousness. God, revive our hearts. God, clean our lives. That God, we can impact our world because this world's gone chaotic. Lord, if you don't intervene, I fear for a lot of young people in this age. Oh God, help us to have the power of God in our lives and on this place. God, help us to see many come to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Now, God, speak to hearts in this invitation. Glorify your name. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.